can start uh, this thing by reading something out to you, which is unusual for me. Um, but 10 days ago, I was sitting on a train and I was reading the Evening Standard. And I noticed a little article in the Evening Standard by a guy called Anthony Hilton, who used to be, when I launched First Direct, he was the business editor of the Evening Standard. Uh, during the time I was developing Mercury, he was actually the managing editor of the Evening Standard. Then he went back on the city desk. And in the period when Egg was launched, he was, again, the business editor of the Standard. Very respected, very insightful business commentator. He's pretty retired now. But he writes the odd article for the Standard. Um, you know, it was back in the quaint old days when you made a major business announcement and you were waiting for the Evening Standard to come out to see what the press thought about it. Nowadays, they, you know before you've got off the stage, they're tweeting about it. And it's in ft.com within 30 minutes. And those quaint old days were 10 years ago. Um, now, Anthony, Anthony uh, Hilton, uh, I always regard him as a little bit old school, a little bit conservative, uh, very skeptical about the internet in the early days. And you should know this is the guy who's writing these things. So, many believe that the age of big corporations is past. They are simply not nimble enough to discover the new products which will keep them abreast of the market. Small businesses can now market across the world with none of the cost and aggravation of previous eras. But talented people don't actually want to work for anyone but themselves. Procter & Gamble now gets 50% of its innovation uh, from non-employees engaging with them and together through the cloud. 200 years ago, 90% of people were self-employed, and it seems we're returning to those days. Now, in some, I thought when I read that, my goodness, that's what Dan was saying three years ago. And that brought another quote into my head. All the forces in the world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And if Anthony Hilton's writing that stuff, I promise you this entrepreneur revolution is definitely an idea whose time has come. And if you want to be a revolutionary, a leader of the revolution, that's pretty exciting, eh? Just the simple thing you can do today is join the KPI program. That's how you get going. It's really that simple. OK, you start a KPI program with a perfect pitch. Who's here who's done perfect pitch with me before? Yes, come on, hands up. There's quite a few of you, right? OK. So you guys can go to sleep now, right? <laughs> You've heard all this stuff before. Yeah? No way. No wrong! Way. It's wrong! It's wrong. Let me tell you something. One of the key things, if you find a powerful body of work that's made a difference to your business, keep returning to it. You're different now. You know more. You're facing different circumstances. Life's moved on. You'll see new ideas. Every time you hear me talk about it, you'll see new ideas. But just to help you this time, I've completely redone the presentation from scratch. So you've never seen it like this before. And that's the most powerful teaching I know how to do. Same principles, same ideas. Listen to them again when you're familiar with it for the first time. But if you can persuade the presenter to present it in a different form, boy, you get a ton of new ideas. OK? So listen to that. All right. Now, Get rid of these notes. And uh, when you're listening to me, whoop, there we go. Um, I want you to have this image in your head. So they're pots of gold. Well, I pretend they're pots of gold. Um, they're resources out in the world. Not just money, obviously money, partnerships, employees, customers distributors, collaborators, whatever you might need to take your idea and your business forward. In my mind, the job of an entrepreneur is to go out and find those pots of gold. Because you can't do it on your own. Okay, So just keep that image in your mind. The job of an entrepreneur is to go out and find the pots of gold in the world that will power up his or her business. So then, what is perfect pitch? And how does it relate to that? Well, Perfect Pitch is a one-day workshop that I lead, simply. It's for ambitious uh, entrepreneurs and business owners. 
Okay? And what I teach them in that one-day workshop is a great answer to a question that we're all asked all of the time. What do you do? I explain to them that in under two minutes, they can leave people uh, interested, excited, and inspired by what they're up to. And I tell them that if they can do that consistently, then the world and all, that in it is, all that's in it is available to them because they will have found the key to unlock those pots of gold. And it's not theoretical work that I deal with. This is the sort of uh, body of work I've developed over years of pitching for uh, money and resources myself, pitching for uh, First Direct and Mercury and Egg and Garlic and raising hundreds of, million, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds for those businesses and indeed building a, a network of collaborators and partners that I needed to, to make them happen. I've listened to thousands of pitches. As a chief executive, as an investor, as an advisor to investors. And I wonder if you have any clue as how many of them even left me interested, <laughs> let alone excited and inspired. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Mostly they leave me confused. What are they talking about, I think? Then I get a little bit sad because I think there may be a great idea in the middle of that somewhere. It'll take them five years to discover whether it was a great idea or not because nobody can understand a word of what they're talking about. And the other feeling I'm left with is I am going to lose the will to live if they say another word because they're boring. And I know that... Actually, they just do not have our prayer. Because, <laughs> you know, if you can't pitch, nothing works. You can have the greatest idea in the world. If you can't explain it and then roll others in it, complete waste of time. So these are the problems I've observed in pitches over the years. So I've created a very simple framework. It's got five principles in it, a whole body of work that lets people in one day develop a pitch that will knock your socks off. That's what it is. Okay? Makes sense. And what I do is I tell everybody to every opportunity they have to give this two-minute pitch. You're going to meet a bunch of people today. If you had a great pitch, give it today. In a bar, in a restaurant, anywhere, give them a two-minute pitch. Your only intention is to get them excited by what you're up to. That's all you care about. That'll open up numerous opportunities for longer pitches where you can actually ask for what you want. Money. <coughs> partnership, joint venture, whatever it is. And I teach the approach to longer pitches as well. And what I'm giving you today is a longer pitch about perfect pitch. And what I want you to do is enroll in the KPI program. Now, before I um, go into the... Uh, what I'm going to do in a minute is unravel what I just told you. Take a look at the architecture of what I just said to you. Why did I say what I said in the order I said it? What were the principles of that? And that'll, that'll give you a sense of how perfect pitch works. But to start with, I just want to say a little bit more about the problems that we typically see. Um, and this, the common one is, what are they talking about? And you've either got gobbledygook, you know, it's just nonsense, or you've got technical jargon. So I always know... The trigger for me on gobbledygook is somebody who starts off, I have a client-centric, oh, no. <laughs> I know the rest of it's going to be complete nonsense. Technical jargon, the ones that gets me normally, as I've got a platform-independent implementation of protocol, HTTP, oh, no, 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 no. So you can't do that. You know, you kind of... If somebody says they've got a platform-independent implementation of protocol, I used to write operating systems, I know what they're talking about. But by the time I've gone back into my memory and said, what's that protocol? I've, I haven't heard the next sentence. You've got to be really clear about things. So that's a big problem. Um, another one, Dan touched on this earlier, is, if, you know, I'm a yoga teacher. Great. There's millions of them in the world. Or I'm an executive coach. Oh, you know, there's 300 of them on Google in London alone. All looking pretty credible. Or I'm going to... Uh, create a new methodology for internet payments. Great. How does that beat PayPal, please? Uh, or I've got a new operating system, right. Um, there's just no segmentation and no differentiation. 
And you can differentiate in two ways. Either you've got a great product that nobody else has got, or it's better than everybody else, or you can focus on a particular niche that you understand so much better than everybody else. I mean, Lazar has both probably. has the best product in London in terms of bodybuilding. But look at his niche, you know? People who've got a lot of money, great in the boardroom, useless naked, or whatever he said. <laughs> words, to that, <laughs> words to that effect. Um, so he knows that market just so much better than anybody else, and that's a fabulous differentiator. Um, so no differentiation, no segmentation, that's the next one. And then, this is sounding very strange. Um, and a lot of the people who, um, who pitch alternative health type propositions, when we first get on the KPI, you kind of think, oh my god. What are they? What is that? That sounds really weird. Now, the thing is, I've had some of the best successes on Perfect Pitch with alternative health. Because if you kind of follow, and I'll give you an example later on of the weirdest thing I ever heard turning into something that everybody in the room instantly wanted. And I'll give you an example of that, but you mustn't sound weird. You can actually sound as weird as you like towards the end of two minutes. In fact, by the, when I'm dealing with these people, I have to calm them down to start with, you know, keep it sensible, don't make any silly claims, don't spook anybody. Then, when it, then in the last half a minute, I really want them to go for it. You know, really go for it. Say what you believe. You have, you've earned it by then. But if you say it first, disaster. And using written language is definitely a big problem. You know, if you speak as though you're reading from an auto cue, then either you're a professional, you do it well if you're a professional TV presenter, otherwise it sounds like you're reading something. And it really doesn't come over. And I tell them, look, it's the language of the pub the language of the street. Simplify it, simplify it. Don't make it complicated. So broadly, these are the problems that we see. And I mean, these are problems I'm talking about in the boardroom. It's not just anywhere. A pitch in a boardroom should be in the language of the street. Um, everywhere, I'm talking about, not just uh, when you're talking to people in a pub. And the final one is a very common one, um, which is you just not, and this is where I get bored, right? It's where I'm kind of losing the will to live. You just get the sense they're not up for this, you know? You know it's going to be tough. You're not sure they know it's going to be tough. You're not sure they know what they're going to have to do to make this happen. Or they're clearly not excited by what they're doing themselves. <laughs> and they just leave you feeling, they drain the energy out of you. And you say, oh no, I need a pill. Um, so the, these are the common mistakes. Um, and so let me go through. I'm going to take a look now. I'm going to deconstruct uh, the architecture of a perfect pitch by breaking up what I said to you to introduce this topic. Okay? First principle is clarity. You've got to get over to people. What are, what are you talking about with no doubt, no question? Don't have them think what do they mean. Just got to be crystal clear. What is it you do? And very, very simple language. So that was what I was saying to you. Uh, to start with, it's just a great answer to the question, what do you do? And in two minutes, it can move people from polite skepticism, which is the way most people listen to you, um, to excited, inspired, interested. Um, and if you can do that consistently... Now, the sec there's another principle here. And when we're on the workshop and when we're developing it, we leave the heart out of it for a long time. So we just work on the rational pitch for a good deal of the workshop, so at least we can get what you're talking about and why we should care. Right at the end, we come to put the heart into it. So, you know, if you're going to leave people interested, excited and inspired, guess what? You've got to discover what it is about what you do that interests, excites, and inspires you. Then you've got to get into the pitch and deliver that full on. So I was doing a little bit of that. Um, and, and, and we put these into the pitch in the workshop right at the end. So I didn't quite say these words, but it was worse to this effect. You know, if you can consistently leave people inspired by what you're up to, then yours is the world and all that's in it, and you'll find all those pots of gold. That's a little bit of fun. That's what excites me about it, you know? You start off with people who haven't got a prayer, and they walk out of the room with pots of, keys to pots of gold. That's very interesting. It's a good way to spend a day, an exhausting way to spend a day, but a really good way to spend a day. So the first principle is clarity. Right at the end of the workshop, we come back and put a bit of a heart and excitement into it. So I promise you nobody's ever going to leave a pitch from somebody I've worked with feeling that they've lost the will to live. That's not going to happen. Never. Um, next one's credibility. This is really important. So I'm crystal clear what you're up to now. Why should I listen to you? 
okay, you know, if you're, if you're well-known, they'll listen to you, but you're not well-known, most of you, you know? So you've met somebody in a pub, and you're just pitching out at them, and they get what you're up to, now why should I listen? So I said something like that. I've been pitching all this stuff for years. I've raised hundreds of millions of pounds. I can always uh, take what I... Uh, I find what I need to get my ideas to fly, and I've listened to several thousand pitches over the years, so I'm claiming expertise with evidence that uh, supports that I can make a difference to people's pitching. Now, we've all got something we can claim there, and I heard Richard Branson pitching his airline in the very early days, and it was, his pitch was perfect, but he had no expertise. He just said, I'm going to build an airline I'd bloody well like to fly on. <laughs> and, um, and that's perfect. Okay, I can listen to you. I get that that's what you're trying to do. Um, oh, there we go. So the next problem is, the next thing is relevance. This is the classic Dragon's Dan challenge. What problem are you trying to solve here? So people have got to get there's a problem out there in the world that, uh, that is worthy of a solution. Um, often you need to put your segmentation in here. So, you, you know, you say there's a bunch of people in the world who aren't being dealt with properly and we can solve a problem for them. It doesn't have to solve a problem for the whole world, but you do have to specify what problem it is you are trying to solve. And, you know, 90% of pitches leave me feeling you haven't got a prayer. <coughs> That's the problem I'm trying to solve. And I'm trying to solve it for ambitious entrepreneurs and business owners for whom a great pitch would make all the difference in the world. Okay? So that's relevance, credibility, and clarity we've got there now. There are three principles. And the final one's believability. So by now I get what you're doing. I get why I should listen to you. I get there's a problem in the world that needs a solution now. What's the solution? I'm all ears all of a sudden because I want to know. This is, by the way, and I'll come back to it later, how the alternative health lady turned everybody around in the room. By the time she got to explaining her extraordinarily weird solution, everybody was desperate for there to be a solution. <laughs> a completely different way of, of, of listening. Um, so that's believability. So that's kind of what I said there. I've got a framework that works on these principles. I teach it in a day. I tell you to give it to everybody you meet. That opens huge numbers of opportunities up for what I call set piece pitches, where you can ask for what you want. That might be money, that might be a partnership, that might just be uh, an employee, actually, or it might just be a, a supplier, come and work with me. So that, those are the, here we go, oh, and the heart business. So I said something like that right at the end, and we often do that at the end of a pitch, you know. Here's what I do for you, and by the way, if you work with me for a day, I promise you that you'll come out a player, your game will be raised, you'll come out as somebody to be reckoned with. So those are, if this builds up, to all of those principles, there we go. The five principles, the perfect pitch, which is clarity, uh, credibility, relevance, and believability, all built on a base of grounded enthusiasm. So the way you get people interested, excited, and inspired is by infecting them with your enthusiasm. That's the way it works. But there's a fine line between that and sounding deluded. Um, so I have to call it grounded enthusiasm, which is you, you, you're giving them this thing that I often don't hear in a pitch, which is you know what it's going to take to pull this off. You're going into it with eyes open. You're not deluded about the nature of the challenge. So that's it, really. That's the architecture uh, of perfect pitch, and that's what we do in a day. As Dan says, we've done it with about 150 people. Uh, in the KPI program so far, and I've done it with about 50 people outside of the KPI program of one sort or another. Um, so we've got about 200 people now. Uh, now, the other thing we get onto is these set piece pitches. Um, so you give your two minute pitch, you open up a bunch of opportunities, somebody says, come in and talk to me for 30 minutes and maybe we can do something together. Um, and the methodology I use for that is imagine you're creating a brochure um, that you're going to leave behind and you're going to talk through the brochure uh, when you uh, make this set piece pitch. So how do you construct the brochure is what we get into. Um, and to be honest, if I'm doing a pitch at the moment, that is exactly what I do. I walk in with a brochure and I talk through the brochure and I leave the brochure behind. Um, generally, it's a different brochure for every pitch because you 
different people have got different things they want to hear. But the fundamental principle of that is whatever else you do, you start it off with this 90-second perfect pitch or this two-minute perfect pitch we did before. Start that. They instantly get it. They get enrolled in your own enthusiasm. They're listening to the brochure in a completely different way. Then what you do in the brochure, the very first thing you do is give them what they most need to give you what you want. So Dan and I have been doing a few pitches recently. I won't tell you what it's about. He might. I don't know whether he wants to or not. But we've been going around together doing a few pitches. And we do this kind of 90-second thing up front. Then our brochure is a little uh, PDF document. It's nothing spectacular. Uh, but by the time we've finished our 90-second pitch, they don't need to know any more about our credibility. They don't need to know anything else about the problem. We've been trying to solve this problem for 100 years would be a typical reaction. They are gagging for the solution. So the whole brochure is about the solution. On the other hand, when I'm pitching garlic, and when I'm pitching garlic, which is my technology company, we're UK's leading supplier of services to protect people against identity theft and financial fraud. Uh, when I'm pitching garlic to distributors, we pitch it with a very glossy brochure, because you have to. Um, but what they want to hear to give us what we want, which is, will you please be one of our distributors, what they're gagging to hear is more about the problem. So you're claiming that cybercrime's running out of control and that virus checkers don't deal with it and that credit checking services don't deal with it. Um, what, how is it running out of control? What's the problem? How are the criminals working? How do they operate? How does it all work? What do you mean command and control server? What do you mean 10% of UK PCs are infected and people don't know? So you have to give them the problem in spades. So this is the trick. Uh, you have to know your audience and on your set piece pitch, you just give them what they need to give you what you want as the very first thing that you do in the pitch. So two parts of a perfect pitch to summarize. Two minute pitch you give to absolutely everybody you meet. That opens up so many opportunities. You just wouldn't believe it. And if you get really good at it and you've got a big idea, an idea whose time has come, they come and find you. Dan is now in this entrepreneur revolution having people seek him out. He has to, they want him in every conversation about entrepreneurship. He's suddenly not become Daniel Priestley. But people do not relate to him as Daniel Priestley anymore. They relate to him as the entrepreneur revolution. He must be in the conversation. He's got something to say. So um, that's, your, that's the most, by the way, that's the most powerful tool anybody can ever give you in business, a two-minute pitch. I, I'll talk to you about my book a bit later, but 60% uh, of the power in there comes from having a great pitch, 60% of it. And quite often in a small business, you don't need much more to be really spectacularly successful. So that's the two-minute pitch. It opens up a load of opportunities for these set-piece pitches, which can be anything from four minutes to an hour. And they can be, you might ask for money. You might be pitching to a journalist to uh, write an article for you. It can be anything, whatever it is you want. The company I worked with way back, a little health company, I noticed they were featured in the, in the Times yesterday. Great big article in the Times, so I guess their pitch is working pretty well. Um, OK, uh, so what do we get from a perfect pitch? I've probably said all this, but let's just, um, let's just go on with it. And you know the one thing, I've, the top bullet point of that slide, power up an idea or discard it, I haven't said much about. I will say something about that in a minute. Um, because the more you pitch an idea, the more you get to understand what it's going to take to make it happen. So that sort of powers it up. But I'm quite happy to discard an idea. You know, you can pitch 20 ideas and eight of them are getting no resonance at all, even though you're pretty excited by them. Get rid of them. Why bother? If you get good at creating ideas, you can throw ideas away. And, you know, I do say to some people I meet, I've never had to do this on a KPI course. I had to do it outside of the KPI environment, though, which is, listen, I, I understand what you're doing. Uh, and I hear the pitch, and I can turn that pitch into the best pitch anybody ever made about that idea, and you'll still fail. So give it up and do something worthwhile. And I do occasionally have to say that, and for me, that's a great result, not me telling them that. If, if I'm concluding that about an idea I've got, that's a great result, because I'm not wasting any more time on it. Um, clearly, you can, in a set piece pitch, you can ask for money, you can get support or funding. Uh, you attract partners, distributors, suppliers. Don't underestimate, if you're building something, the power of a network of committed suppliers. You might be paying them, but I tell you what, if they're enrolled in your own enthusiasm for something, you get 10 times as much out of them as if they're just going through the motions. 
So, and you can brief a supplier really brilliantly with a pitch about what you need from them, and they'll perform out of their skin. Um, one of the keys for me in putting egg together was at a great marketing agency, um, this agency called Hal Henry Chaldecott and Lurie, who actually were voted the agency of the decade uh, soon after the launch of egg. And they were more, almost more committed to egg than I was. And they were powerful and passionate advocates of it. Um, and when I was thinking of swapping agencies halfway through, just because I wanted to freshen up the advertising, they said, oh, we can't do that, we'll, do it. we'll work for nothing. I mean, they're really, really committed to the, the concept. So don't underestimate the power of that. And of course, with KPI, what you're going to do is to use the, the pitch, uh, the centerpiece of the pitch to spread the word across the world through books and a net presence and products and, uh, at, of course, attract JV partners, as Dan was saying. So that's what we do. Here's how I kind of built up this um, competence in pitching, if you like. Um, that's the launch of First Direct all those years ago. There's a young guy and an old guy. And I'm the young guy. And the old guy's Kit McMahon, who was chairman of Midland Bank at the time. And a year before that, uh, Kit had sent me out of his office with a cheque for £20 million, um, saying, go away and don't tell anybody about this, but go and build that banking idea of yours. And don't tell anybody in Midland about it, because they'll kill it. Well, of course, we could not not tell anybody about it. We'd have to tell a few people. It was a very covert project. Um, and you, you imagine that's what I was pitching to Kit. Can you give me 20 million pounds to build a competitor, please? <laughs> a competitor the, whose key uh, competence is going to be a better job in dealing with customers than you can do through your branches. Because uh, your branches do a lousy job in dealing with customers. And we're going to pitch that we're going to have intelligent people who know what they're doing on the phones, unlike the branches. That's the way we're going to pitch it. Not a brilliant... <laughs> Not a brilliant uh, idea, you would have thought. But by the time I got to see Kit about this, I'd been, trying, I'd been floating this idea of First Direct in Midland for months and getting numerous, that's a stupid idea, type of responses. So by the time I got to him, I was pretty clear about what I had to tell him for, to get him to support it. Um, even so, I was pretty lucky with him. He was a great visionary. He needed a big idea. He saw this as a big idea. Um, and therefore, he was. I saw it how strategically it did make sense, although it looked like it was a competitor. Uh, but uh, and so I was lucky. I was lucky with him. But it taught me a lot about pitching. And of course, that was just the start. That was the press conference. You can imagine the sceptical world: a bank without branches. There's never been a bank without branches. How does it work? How do you send money down the telephone? <laughs> I promise. I promise you that was a question from a respected journalist at the press conference. So then, of course, you have to pitch it, pitch it, pitch it uh, into a skeptical world over and over and over again. The Independent, that later became a great supporter, christened it a bank for insomniacs. Because <laughs> nobody could understand why you would need 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week banking. I mean, it's extraordinary that that's questioned these days. But back in eight, 1989, it was, who would want to bank after 5 o'clock at night? <laughs> I don't get it. So that's really in the sheer hell of explaining First Direct to a skeptical world really sharpened up my ability to pitch. Um, and, oh, I wonder what this is about. A secret. Oh, yeah. Even then, so, right, so I'd done First Direct, I'd been through the growth of Mercury, um, and I got, came to pitch Egg, which was an idea to uh, change the way people related to financial services using the internet as the vehicle for that. First internet bank in the world for many, many years the biggest. And um, I said everybody rejected egg, literally everybody when I first pitched it. So that was kind of, hmm, blimey. I thought I was good at this stuff. And this is a brilliant idea. It's going to be a winner. I don't understand why everybody's rejecting it. I was very puzzled. Um, but, of course, it did grow into a game changer, as I say. It, it, it floated three years after. Uh, I started to pitch it at a value of £1.3 billion. Pounds. It was pretty big from zero to over a billion. Um, and it shifted the entire financial services industry, turned it on its head. FT said fundamentally changed the face of financial services worldwide, which isn't a bad thing to put on your CV. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that's not the secret, really. I want to tell you something that's an underappreciated aspect of business. 
It's probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. Lazo, um, Lazo said to me that once that this was the thing that most, uh, most powered him up about the whole perfect pitch process. And the thing is, it's this. This is the secret. The, the response that I most want from a pitch is that will never work. And that's what I got from Egg over and over and over again. And so my response to that is, OK, what would I need to do to make it work? And if you've got them interested and excited and inspired, they'll probably tell you, which lets you then, when you're pitching, every time you pitch, the pitch gets stronger. And you say, OK, you may think this will never work because, but think about this. You've got a solution to it. And this, this is where the grounded enthusiasm in a pitch comes in, because you are very, very clear um, that you know what it's going to take to pull this off, and you know how to do it. By the way, they're designing the whole process for you while they're telling you why it would never work. The whole process is being carefully designed by the world for you. So you know that network of resources that's out there, the, the pots of gold? The most valuable pots of gold are the designers. The people who will tell you why it won't work, then tell you what you have to do to make it work, therefore doing your design. And that was um, one of the some of the responses we made at Egg to that will never work. The technology is immature. It can't possibly work. You're too early with this internet nonsense. OK, we've prototyped the technology with Sun. It works. Internet's not mass market yet. There's only half a million people connected in the UK. We've, look, we've researched this with 5,000 people. We've spoken to 1,000 face to face. This is going to fly. It actually became the fastest growing bank ever launched in the UK. Uh, it hits five year targets for customer acquisition in the first six months. Can you imagine that? It was a bit of a strain operationally. Uh, but in the pitch, I was just saying, look, people love the idea. And we've been challenged on the economics, and correctly so. And we said, look, to make these economics work, we've got to acquire customers at an average of 50 pounds a shot. We know the market norm at the moment is over 100. But here's our plan to get it down to 50. We've got this very odd sounding brand called Egg. That'll get some attention. Look at the ads. They're absolutely stunning. Are we going to knock the socks off that £100? We did. We got it down to £20 in the end. So we got, but I, before everybody told me it wouldn't work, I really didn't know we needed to do that. So great piece of design by all the skeptics. Now, somebody flashed something that said 10 on it to me a minute ago. What did that mean? 10 minutes left. I, thought I, I was looking at my clock and thought I had longer than that. Anybody want to tell me how much longer I got? 10 plus Q&A. 10 plus Q&A. Fantastic. All righty. Um, so that was Egg. Um, then, of course, on the day it was launched, you end up on the Today program being mangled by John Humphreys. <laughs> and um, now, I tell you, this is where my whole architecture has got sharpened up because he wants to entertain his audience. So either you're going to do it or he's going to do it. He gives you 15 seconds to decide whether you're going to be the entertainment or he is. <laughs> if you don't grab him in 15 seconds, he rips you to shreds in a really entertaining way. And you've got 90 seconds in total to pitch. So I did all right with him. And my mental model of everybody I'm teaching to pitch is you've got to be able to withstand that. That's the gold standard. That's where I'm going to try and take you. Uh, and then Egg, of course, beyond the launch, went on, as I said, to be a big and very valuable and very famous company. Um, I think perhaps one of the most impressive things about it, though, by, by using these techniques of pitching, I got Microsoft into a big joint venture with us in the UK through MSN. And I got Microsoft building software with us as a joint venture, which Bill Gates went around the world demonstrating, saying it was the best example of uh, the next generation web software he'd ever seen. No, his guys built it, but um, they, built it, they built it with us. So the Remember pitch is not about solely about money. It is about the relationships and the joint ventures that you can generate as a consequence of getting other people uh, enrolled in your enthusiasm. Now, I've got 10 minutes plus Q&A. Right, so moving on rapidly. This is what I promised you earlier. Uh, this is the lady that caused me to think, oh my god, what am I going to do with that? And the more I asked her about what she did, the worse it got. And um, so where we, where we ended up was this. I got a particular skill and a unique complementary therapy, only 20 of us in the world. I work with individuals to improve physical health and emotional and mental well-being. She went on to talk about the guy who created the discipline, who had a huge reputation in medicine, 
how she'd worked with him for seven years. Uh, you had to have five years training before you could qualify, how they were very focused on just a few conditions. Uh, I think she used chronic fatigue as one example, but she had a list of five or six. The conventional medicine said, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do with these conditions. If you got them, you have to live with them. And she said, here are my case studies. Of my last 100 patients, 99 are successful. At that point, we didn't care what she did. <laughs> Anybody who had one of those problems wanted to work with her. So you can turn pretty much anything around and as long as there's something valuable there. Um, uh, and who's it for? Now, uh, I do a lot of work with corporate ideas people, people trying to make ideas happen in, um, in big companies, executives and employees of big companies, but where it really triggers is entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, you have more leverage with them than anybody else, and here's the reason why, very quickly. It's, it's actually magic for entrepreneurs and business owners. It's just useful for everybody else. And here's the reason. You don't have to keep your mouth zipped. If you're an entrepreneur and a business owner, you can say what you want. In a corporate environment, you're very constrained on what, you, what is it acceptable to say. Um, and even if you're allowed to say it, you have to move mountains to make it happen. And those mountains aren't in the way of all those dollars if you're, a, if you're an entrepreneur or business owner. That's why it works so well for people like you. Um, I'm coming right to the end now. That's my website, like findyourlightbulb.com. Those who've been there before, this is brand new, with the help of one of the people who I met on the KPI course. I put a brand new website together. It is dedicated to the art of high performance. Um, high performance is getting breakthrough results with breathtaking speed and ease. Don't mean easy, I mean feeling at ease with yourself and the world as you take them on. It's very full of videos now. It's got lots of new takes on all the stuff I've spoken to you on the KPI thing and many more things besides. If you visit it and join up, you get lots of free videos, little sound bites, and a whole series of them. Because every time I do a workshop or every time I do a speech, you get some video, wow, I explained that better than I've ever explained it before. Or here's a new insight, I've got to give the world this new insight. So you get a whole stream of videos. It's all completely free. I'm not trying to sell anything other than the book, but I don't really care whether you buy that or not. Um, They've got 50 copies here for you, 10 pounds a shot. That book's all about high performance. I read that book over and over again. It's surprisingly, it's very sad. I know I wrote it. But, um, <laughs> but for me, see, I wrote it as a manual of high performance, how to get impossible things done fast. And I, forgot all, I forget all of that stuff when I'm in the middle of a problem. So I go back and read it and think, oh, yes, I know how to deal with this. Um, so I read it all the time. I see new things in it, new ideas in it. I think they've got some for you here. The website, though, will have a lot of video on it, a lot of uh, teaching material as things go forward. So do join that. And here's my final thing. Here's a quote from Warren Bennis, 87, I think he is now, a little bit older than my dad, and just as awkward. And um, he's a professor of business administration at the University of Southern California, a bit of a mentor to me in the early days, wrote all the books, 87, 85 of them to be precise, on leadership. Uh, he is the guy who had the quote about creating a dent in the universe, all you people who misattribute it to Steve Jobs. Now, Steve was no doubt influenced by him as well, and Steve very much has used the dent in the universe um, as, a, as something he says a lot about what he's up to at Apple. Uh, but Bennis uh, invented that putting a dent in the universe is a great thing to be involved in. Um, and with this KPI program and the entrepreneur revolution. I have to tell you, young Daniel Priestley is seeking to create the most almighty dent. And I, for one, am very proud to be associated with him, and I hope to see some of you in a KPI session very soon, and thank you very much. <clears throat>
you really can. And you can use it as a vehicle for any set piece, piece of work, whether it's a book or a website or anything else. You just want to make sure you get the same messages over and over and over again. Obviously, in a book, you've got an opportunity to give a lot more examples, a lot more substantiation, a lot more uh, tools and techniques. So, you know, the book is sort of, a, a, it's not only uh, talking about the pitch, it's actually building out the product behind the pitch. Great. Just up the back here. Yeah, you could well ask. So just quickly repeat that. If Sorry. you're giving if you're giving a pitch to a, an investor, often you just get a no, but you don't get enough feedback. So what's a good way to get the feedback? Is that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I would just email them or phone them and ask. And uh, you know, if you ask them in a sort of a way that causes them to justify their decision, you won't get any feedback at all. But if you ask them in a way that says, "Look, I obviously didn't land that with you. I was disappointed by that. Can you just tell me what you didn't hear that you'd have had to hear to make that work for you?" That you'll, almost anybody would respond to that sort of question. The other thing, though, you know, but make, before you go in an investor, make a pitch to everybody in the world, everybody will listen to you, um, who hasn't got money to give you. But you know, pitch, if I was asking you for money, would you give it me? Oh, God, I wouldn't invest in you, mate, because of this, 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 and this. So your friends will tell you, you know. Here. Yeah. Um, at the risk of at the risk of ridicule for the oh. rest of the day, I am the light body surgeon. Oh, it's you! <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't misrepresent you. <laughs> Sorry. And what I want to say is, the perfect pitch day was not a particularly comfortable experience, as you can imagine. <laughs> What it has done, it really made me stick with how can I get my work so that it's more accessible for more people? Because what I do is phenomenal. Yeah. And so I am grateful to you for holding that very, very tight space of it has to be clear, people have to understand it. Because now I have developed a, a new service which to a wide, I can offer it to a group of people, which will phenomenally affect their energy levels and experience of life. And that has, in large part, been due to your cauldron. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, that was a great pleasure. I'm really pleased to hear that. And you know, at the end of that day, everybody in the room wanted to work with you. Yeah. That's brilliant, yeah. Very good. We've, we've got time for one last question. <laughs> one question up here. About, uh, you talked about a support network. Um, oh, I'm sorry, support a support, support network. network. Yeah. Who helps you, and what was it about that really helped you? Well, there's different people in different um, times, I suppose. Um, I think at first direct, where I needed most help, because that was sort of the first business I'd ever built. I was, I was an IT guy, really. I didn't know much about business at the time. I relied a lot on uh, suppliers. So I kind of got everybody enrolled. This is a brilliant thing. You know, it's the first new bank in the UK for 100 years. And it's designed around customer service. And it's radical and innovative. And wow. So it attracted a bunch of really quality suppliers of all sorts. And I learned a lot from them, really. I said, God, I, particularly on marketing. You know, what is marketing exactly? I know what, I sort of can pronounce the word. But what, what does it really mean? So I had to immerse myself in that with the suppliers. Later at Mercury, where I had a challenge I'd never by the time I finished First Direct, I pretty much knew how to grow businesses. But at Mercury, the challenge was transforming an existing business and creating a whole bunch of new value to replace the inevitable decline in, in the value that had already been built there. It was a ra really radical and hard transformation. And I used, at that point, I started to work with business coaches. And I found them. I uh, met Bennis at that point and a, f and a few other very powerful business coaches. And I learned quite a lot about leadership from them, which I've actually boiled down into one simple principle, which is in one of the chapters in my book. It's called Balanced on the Edge of Reason. And it's sort of how to stay on track when you're leading a difficult situation without either becoming deluded or uh, becoming resigned to the fact it will never work. Um, and I got that from these coaches. That isn't what they told me. That's what I took out from them and created it as my own approach to, to, to leadership. So coaches a lot at Mercury. Um, 
At AG, I was arrogant enough to think I knew most of it. But actually, to be honest, what I at AG, what I needed was really to understand the internet a bit better. It was sort of in the early days at that point. So uh, Sun were very helpful, particularly Sean McNally, who was uh, chairman and chief CEO of Sun. He got very engaged with AG, very excited by it, very interested in it, and gave us a lot of help, uh, as did the top guys at, um, at one or two of the technology companies around the world, actually. Um, so yeah, so that, that was at AG. Um, at Garlic, um, we attracted more help than we needed, really, but the, the biggest help there, we have Tim Berners-Lee working with us at Garlic. Um, you know, Tim's obviously the inventor of the web. He only advises one company in the world, that's us. He found us, we didn't find him. So um, he's, he's a huge amount of help on, on the future of the web, I think. He's very engaged in making sure the web doesn't disintegrate and deteriorate and not become what it was originally intended to be. And he's very active with the major players on the web and with governments and everybody else uh, to try and keep that on track. So he's really useful in that regard. So you attract what you need, basically, if you can pitch it well, is the simple principle there. Very good. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, great pleasure.